And welcome to Pick 6 Movies. I'm Chad Cooper, and you've made your way to the inaugural episode of Season 19 of the Pick 6 Movies Podcast. You know, the podcast where every season I'm joined with my lifelong friend, Mr. Bo Ransdell, on a journey where we select a special theme, and then we find six movies that are all related to that theme. Then we have six individual episodes where we provide you with all kinds of behind the scenes information to explain the who's and what's and why's and when's and how's and who's and oh really's find how the movie was made. Then after about 20 minutes of fun facts and useless information, Mr. Bo Ranzel and I get together and provide you with a full review of the movie filled with snarky jokes and stupid voices and a genuinely entertaining slog through the movie's plot. This season's theme is Die Hard Ons, featuring six movies that are ripoffs of the original action-packed extravaganza Die Hard. You know, the movie where a regular old guy finds himself going up against a group of bad guys who have a plan to blow something up or steal something or kill somebody. And it's up to our lovable Joe Sixpack to rise to the occasion and thwart the bad guy's plans. Doesn't that sound like a delightful movie premise that we will revisit half a dozen times over the next few weeks? <laughs> I thought so too. Tonight's episode features Under Siege 2 Dark Territory. It's Die Hard, but on a train. And it's got Steven Seagal and Katherine Heigl and a bunch of other people you might recognize if you were into watching bad movies from the 90s. There's a satellite that makes earthquakes or something. Steven Seagal kind of does martial arts. I, I'm looking at it. Look, the movie's terrible. But that's kind of what we do around here is talk about terrible movies. So let's quit wasting time. Let's get Mr. Bo Ransdell in here to start giving us all those fun facts I was talking about. And we're going to start season 19's theme, Die Hard Ons. Buckle up, it's going to be a hell of a ride. At 10 till 7 in the morning on August 7th, 1963, the UP special train left Glasgow Central Station in Scotland headed for London. The train consisted of its engine and 12 carriage cars, along with the 72 members of the post office staff who would be sorting mail the whole way. The UP special was a TPO train, a traveling post office, and it was about to go down in history. Of the 12 cars, the one right behind the engine was known as the HBP, short for High Value Packages. In many cases, those packages were honest to goodness sacks of money. Usually, there was about 300,000 pounds in the HVP car. This trip, there would be between 2.5 and, and 3 million. There had been a bank holiday, and the UP special would be delivering mail and money all along the line on the journey to London. This HVP car also had no alarms and no bars on the windows, despite the fact that the post office investigative branch had ordered that all such cars be fitted with protective devices like set alarms and iron bars. But those cars were out of service at the time, so the UP Special had no such protections. There were no cameras deemed too expensive at the time to implement, and so the millions of pounds rolled along the rail lines, no more protected than a letter to Santa. A security officer on the take let it be known that the money was on the train and unprotected, and who did he tell? Why, two London crooks by the name of Gordon Goody and Buster Edwards. Buster was the man with the plan, and he brought in two other accomplices, Charlie Wilson and Bruce Reynolds. The four of them had found some success with robberies in the London area, though I should point out none of these robberies involved a train, which presented its own set of problems. Namely, how do you stop it, get a bunch of money off of it, and get the hell out of there? To that end, our quartet of thieves enlisted the aid of another London gang, known as the South Coast Raiders. The Raiders were made up of Tommy Wisby, Bob Welch, and Jim Hussey, who had robbed trains before, and Roger Cordry, who knew how to rig the signals along the track to stop a train. With our quartet turned into an octet, planning began in earnest. By the time they were prepared for the heist, about 16 men total would be part of the caper. Just after 3 a.m. on August 8th, the UP special stopped when a red light signal was seen. The train's second-in-command, cleverly called the Second Man, 
climbed off the train to call the signalman to see what was the matter. He discovered, however, that the lines of communication were cut. Alarmed, he returned to the train, but was nabbed on his way back and subdued by one of the gang. The heist was officially on. More of the gang rushed into the cabin of the engine, knocking out the conductor. The plan was to move the train about half a mile up the track where the money in the HVP could be unloaded. To that end, the gang hired a conductor of their own to guide the train to its proper place, but their hired hand was a retired conductor and had no familiarity with the type of engine he was now expected to guide to its destination. So, the old engineer was sent to the back to help bag money with the rest of the gang while they roused the actual conductor to take them, under duress, to the rendezvous. Mills, the actual conductor of the train, who now had a pretty good goose egg on his noggin and was being forced to guide the train under his care to a thieves' meeting, drove the train to the meeting place, which was defined by a white sheet pulled across the tracks just short of Bredego Bridge. Once stopped, the HVP car was rushed by more of the thieves, overwhelming the handful of employees inside. All the civilians were forced to lie face down in the car while the robber stole all but eight of the 128 sacks in the HVP carriage. 30 minutes after the robbery had begun, it was over. The thieves stealing away into the early morning on trucks bearing the same license plate numbers to further elude authorities. They had also cut all the phone lines in the area, so the alarm wasn't raised until someone managed to flag down a passing train around 4.20 that morning. On the VHF band radio, which the thieves also monitored, came this call from the police, quote, A robbery has been committed and you'll never believe it. They've stolen the train. While our robbers were listening in on the VHF radio, they were also en route back to their hideout at Leather Slade Farm, which they had purchased for the express purpose of using it as a hideout and base of operations, as it sat only about 30 miles from the crime scene. There, they split up the take, amounting to roughly $150,000 apiece, or over a million dollars apiece when adjusted for today's inflation. They also used the take to replace the fake money in a spirited game of Monopoly in celebration that day. The police, who were now on the scene, made a smart deduction. A witness told them that one of the robbers said, Don't move for half an hour. And so, the police surmised correctly that the thieves were somewhere in a 30-mile radius. When this hit the press, a dragnet ensued, and the robbers realized the police were hotter on their trail than they hoped. Accomplice Brian Field showed up the day after the robbery to get his share and was enlisted to help find some getaway cars that hadn't been seen by witnesses. Cars were found and the order was given to a member of the gang, known as Mark, to clean up the farm and set fire to it when everyone was gone. Charlie Wilson arranged a meeting for the following Monday to ensure the plan was carried out to his specifications and only then discovered the farm had not, in fact, been torched. Wilson almost killed Brian Field, who was responsible for the pyro part of the plan, but was restrained by some others in the core of the gang. And before they could regroup and head to the farm to do the job that hadn't been done by Mark, who had apparently split town, the police found the farmhouse. At the farmhouse, the trucks used in the getaway were located, along with food and bedrolls, and notably, the Monopoly board game used by the thieves with actual money, if you'll remember. On that board was a ketchup bottle from which they could lift partial fingerprints and a palm print. Despite this good news, the police were largely at a loss. That is, until Scotland Yard received a tip from an informant looking to shave some time off his jail sentence after being incarcerated just before the robbery. Along with an unnamed woman, the story of the robbery began to take shape for the police. They assembled 18 names and began checking those names against the prints taken from the farmhouse. It may surprise you to hear this, but thieves are an untrustworthy bunch. As soon as the police started picking up some of the robbers they'd assembled as suspects, backbiting and finger-pointing led to the arrests of 11 of the participants of the Great Train Robbery. Those who were shown to be directly involved received sentences in excess of 30 years, excessive according to the thieves and likely so long due to the high-profile nature of the case, not to mention the pure audacity of it. While several of the robbers would later escape, including Charlie Wilson, who even got some plastic surgery and moved to Quebec, none lasted for more than a few years in the wild. This was largely due to the persistence of Tommy Butler. 
one of the lead investigators of the robbery and a man known for his dogged pursuits of criminals, often called One Day Tommy for catching his men so quickly. As for the money itself, less than a third was ever recovered. It remains one of the most daring robberies ever committed and a story for the ages. Which brings us to another criminal enterprise built around a train. The subject of this episode, Under Siege 2, Dark Territory. This will be our first introduction into the oeuvre of Steven Seagal, which feels like a crime unto itself. But how did this movie happen? Well, it started with the ape-loving future director and then screenwriter Matt Reeves. Reeves would later go on to write and direct the remake of Let the Right One In, titled Let Me In for American Audiences, as well as helming the recent Planet of the Apes series that was actually good, unlike the Apes movie done by Tim Burton. See Season 8, Episode 2 for more on that. But in the late 80s and early 90s, there was what was called a spec boom in Hollywood. Basically, that meant you would write a script for no money that you used as a calling card of sorts, and that could get you a gig writing for a big studio on one of their projects. So Reeves wrote a script that was essentially die hard on a train by his own admission, and he never thought anyone would make it. It was simply an exercise intended to get him noticed and get some more work. Originally called Dark Territory, then later End of the Line, Reeves put it out into the world of spec scripts where it floundered, the spec script market had abruptly died on him before he could make the sale. What Reeves couldn't have expected is the way his script and the success of an unlikely action hero would dovetail. While we shall certainly cover the life and times of Steven Seagal somewhere down the track, at the time of Under Siege 2, Seagal was an established action star. The rumor goes that an agent by the name of Michael Ovitz was taking Aikido lessons from Seagal and wanted to prove that he could make literally anyone an action movie star. This led to the development of the movie Above the Law and Ovitz asking Seagal to star in that picture. The movie was a moderate hit, making almost $19 million on an $8 million budget, but it succeeded in proving two things. One, that Michael Ovitz could indeed make anyone an action star, and two, that Seagal could perform the basic functions of a human action hero in film. Above the Law was followed by similar sounding movies, Hard to Kill, Mark for Death, and Out for Justice, all of which made money if not becoming outright hits. But the success was more tempered, making him more of a niche star. That is, until the release of the movie Under Siege in 1992. Under Siege was a spec script, see above, regarding Matt Reeves' scheme to get rich and famous, called Dreadnought. When Seagal was attached, the movie went under significant rewrites and retooling of the film's budget of $30 million, and to bend to the idea that Seagal had for the film. As his career climbed, so goes the story, did Steven Seagal's ego, making him more dictatorial of what would and would not go in the films in which he starred. Writer of Dreadnought, now called Under Siege, J.F. Lawton said that there was a conscious effort to take Seagal out of the action subgenre and push him into the mainstream, giving him more to do in the movie besides kick bad guys in the face. Terry Simmel, the head of Warner Brothers at the time, wanted to reteam Seagal with director Andrew Davis, who helmed Above the Law with Seagal. At the time, the script had Seagal in the movie for less than half the runtime, the meteor role going to the villain, who would be played by. Well, this can't be right. Tommy Lee Jones? Whatever you say, 1990s. Anyways, the part of the hero, Casey Ryback, was beefed up. About the shooting of the film, Andrew Davis said in non-hostage fashion, It was fine. It was fine. It worked out well. We had a nice time down in Mobile and had a lot of fun making the movie, and that was how the movie got me The Fugitive, so it was worth it. That's the sound of pride. The movie is certainly elevated by the cast, including the aforementioned Tommy Lee Jones, or, that still doesn't seem right, along with the second in villainy, Gary Busey. Cole Meany, recently seen on the show as a pilot flying into the earth in Die Hard 2, shows up, along with Dale Dye and Nick Mancuso, who would both reprise their roles in the sequel, which we'll get to in just a minute. The movie is Die Hard on a Boat, with Seagal's Casey Ryback stuck in a freezer when Tommy Lee Jones, Gary Busey, and their team of domestic terrorists taking control of a ship while Seagal and Playboy Playmate Erica Laniac 
also seen in Bordello of Blood on Pick 6 Movies, Season 12, Episode 5, play cat and mouse with the villains and eventually save the day. The movie went on to make over $150 million, which gave it the inauspicious status of being the most successful movie never having been screened for critics before its release at the time. As Andrew Davis, the director noted, Harrison Ford saw a rough cut and gave him the thumbs up to direct The Fugitive, which is pretty good. And Under Siege was also nominated for two Academy Awards for Best Sound and Best Sound Effects Editing, which makes it the Oscar-nominated Under Siege. Whatever Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences. It was a given that the movie would produce a sequel. Enter Matt Reeves' Train High script and an even more ego-driven Seagal, and now Under Siege 2 was in the works, a follow-up to a wildly successful movie that set Seagal as an honest-to-goodness movie star. In between, he did the less well-received On Deadly Ground, which starred Michael Caine and Billy Bob Thornton alongside Seagal, but this was less popular than his first Die Hard ripoff, so a lot was riding on his next Die Hard ripoff. Reeves was candid about the fact that it was, in fact, Die Hard on a Train, but also pointed out the hero was intended to be less seagal y What I love about Die Hard, he said, was this idea of the underdog that there's this guy, especially in the first movie, who's a cop from New York who doesn't even have shoes, and somehow he has got to save this building, save the day. That was what the movie was supposed to be, but it didn't end up being that. So Matt Reeves seems to have understood what makes a good Die Hard movie. So what happened? According to co-star of Under Siege 2, Morris Chestnut, who played the porter Bobby Zacks, the only time they stuck to the script was when Seagal wasn't on set. Chestnut said he would come to set, Okay, you're going to say this, I'm going to say this, and then this is going to happen, and then you do it. That's how we did a lot of this movie, he said. The director of this ad-libbed nonsense was Jeff Murphy, who had done Young Guns 2 and Free Jack in his lead-up to taking over Under Siege 2. He described the shoot as, quote, a very dreary process and highly contentious at the time. Lots of arguments and stuff. The movie, he says, only came together in the editing, where he was able to create some energy and pace. While the cast isn't exactly Tommy Lee Jones level, Eric Bogosian, who plays Travis Dane in the film, was a well-respected actor and writer. He had written several one-man pieces for off-Broadway productions, including the extremely popular Sex, Drugs, and Rock and Roll, and plays like Talk Radio, for which he was nominated for a Pulitzer. The play was adapted into a film directed by Oliver Stone, in which Bogosian starred, and in many ways presages the conversation about the relationship between audience and creator we see in the media now. You can see him on the incredibly successful HBO series Succession, as well as old Law & Order reruns. Again, no Tommy Lee Jones, but not too shabby. The second tier villain is a first class actor who we've seen before in Season 9 Episode 2 of Pick 6 Movies as Reverend Werewolf in Silver Bullet. Everett McGill is a great actor who is perhaps best known for his role as Ed in David Lynch's Twin Peaks, but appeared in a number of films like Brubaker with Robert Redford, Heartbreak Ridge with Clint Eastwood, and Wes Craven's The People Under the Stairs. I particularly like the story that David Lynch had to find McGill on his rather secluded farm to lure him out of retirement for that Twin Peaks revival, which was also amazing. Morris Chestnut, the aforementioned Bobby Zacks, had appeared in Boys in the Hood before this film, along with a couple of others, and he would go on to do two more with Seagal called Half Past Dead and Prince of Pistols in the early and mid-2000s. He also won the Madden Bowl in 1998, which is fun. And he was the sexiest man alive from People Magazine in 2015, and that ain't nothing. Playing Seagal's niece, Sarah Ryback, is Katherine Heigl, who would have been about 17 at the time the movie came out. She was a model prior to some early roles in movies like My Father the Hero, with notorious airplane wine drinker Gerard Depardieu. Under Siege 2 is early in her career, and it wouldn't really be until Grey's Anatomy in 2005 that she would get the kind of stardom that would lead to higher profile roles in Knocked Up, The Ugly Truth, and 27 Dresses. So there is life after Seagal. Heigl said later of the film that Seagal came across a bit creepy, saying on the last day of filming, quote, You know, Katie, I got girlfriends your age. When she countered with the obvious, Isn't that illegal? Seagal responded, They don't seem to mind. That tracks with a story from Jenny McCarthy, who stated she was asked to undress for him when she was auditioning for a role in the movie as well. 
There are lots of stories like that following Seagal in his career, but back to the movie this creep did, and not the creep himself. So it's a pretty good cast, despite the chaos Seagal fomented on the set. When the movie was released, it underperformed, with a $105 million take on a $60 million budget. Critically, it was panned on account of it being the movie that it is. Pixix Ghost of Reviews past Roger Ebert was surprisingly positive, giving it 3 out of 4 stars, despite his criticism that the action outstaged the actors. It was also pointed out Seagal couldn't really, you know, act. But is Under Siege 2 a misunderstood classic, or a train movie that commits the greatest heist of all, the time of the viewer? To answer that, let's get co-host and co-most in Chad Cooper for a look at this satellite-filled romp. Ladies and gentlemen, Rybacks and Danes, it's 1995's Under Siege 2, Dark Territory. Welcome to a, a season opener yes! of, of Pick 6 Movies. I am one of your hosts, Bo. I'm the other one, Chad. Yes. Very excited to get started. Just really champing at the bed. I, I'm so excited about this season. It's season 19, Bo. Die Hard On. A bunch of movies that are basically a holdover from the last season we did. It's a bunch of Die Hard knockoffs. I love this shit. It reminds me how much I like Die Hard. I'll say that much. We'll <laughs> see where we land at the end of the season. Oh, it's going to be in a dumpster. We are beginning with sort of a correction, I feel like, because mm -hmm. we have gone 18 full seasons. Yes. Without ever once doing a Steven Seagal movie. How is that possible? I think it's because <laughs> Steven Seagal movies are trash, even by our estimation. And he lives in that world that is occupied like a Charles Bronson. And I don't uh -huh. mean like a Magnificent Seven Charles Bronson. Right. But maybe I do. Like Charles Bronson in all those Death Wish sequels. Where you're mm -hmm. like, someone asks you, like, hey, have you ever seen Death Wish 4? You're like, no, why would I have ever seen that, you know? <laughs> I feel the same way about Steven Seagal movies where somebody is like, hey, have you ever seen License to Assassinate or whatever? Right. Steven Seagal movie happens to be on the, the question. And I'm like, no, of course not. I think Steven Seagal is a god-awful actor, and the action scenes aren't very good. He's not an actor, though. No, no. Uh, you know, as we talked about in the introduction, he was, at the time uh, he was cast in his first action movie, he was just a dude who knew a little karate and knew a Hollywood agent. And, <laughs> you know, these are the coke-fueled days of the 80s and early 90s, so it was just some coked-up agent being like, you know what, pal? I think I can make you a star. Yeah, that whole piece of movie history feels like a real-life trading places moment. I'm going to bet you a dollar that you can't make anyone into a movie star. I'll take that bet, sir. Right. Hiya! Hicha! That man must become a movie star. You're on. It's also because, Chad, and I don't mean to impugn the good name of any of our listeners ever, but people who watch exclusively action movies uh -huh. are stupid. Yes. And all they want to see is stuff blow up and people hit each other. And yes. usually it's oiled men to say that it is a cover, a beard for uh -huh. latent homosexuality oh is my. to do it a disservice. Right. Kind of like watching professional wrestling a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Bro, I watch it for the store. It's like a soap opera for guys, you know, with big muscular men rolling around in tight little panties just grabbing each other i mean there's chicks in here but not that much we got the guys grabbing their pecs and their thighs and just hugging and kissing you know probably not telling their dad how they really feel about other guys and stuff i love the wrestling sexuality is a spectrum right sure it, it doesn't matter that you enjoy watching oiled up men wrestle around just be cool about it own it right he's got yeah. a great body i'm not saying i want to fuck him but I ain't saying I don't. <laughs> Just let that happen. Let that be part of your life and be good with it. And you're going to be a happier person. Right. Why do you like professional wrestling? Because I like watching big muscular men grab each other and roll around. Something about that entertains slash excites me. Then like wonderful. 
Yeah. God bless you. You know that about yourself. Why do I like George Clooney chuckling to himself? Because I find <laughs> it very seductive. This movie feels like a big screen adaptation of a low rent TV show like MacGyver or Simon and Simon. You know what I mean? It's poorly written and it's, you know, you mentioned in the intro that they slapped this together with editing. But as I watch it, I was like, the editing in this movie is terrible terrible it's all wrapped around a narrative that doesn't make any sense and it's very difficult to follow i think the thing with the editing in this movie is that they never live in one scene long enough for you to realize how boring it is it is a movie that constantly says look over there look over there what's over there who's over here it's almost to the point to where they interrupt one sentence of dialogue then cut away to another scene where you get one sentence of dialogue and then you cut to a different scene with one sentence of dialogue then we come back to the first scene to get the second sentence of dialogue it's this bizarro world of row 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 your boat in the rounds and none of it comes together it's terribly confusing and i also don't like that they don't use the train in this movie to great effect i mean at the end they crash it spoilers but they don't use the train as a source of action and adventure or peril or suspense because Bo I just want to ask you when you think of the great train sequences in movies and you talked about the great train Robbie which is a entertaining film wonderful book by Michael Crichton Mm -hmm. but when you think about great train sequences in action and adventure movies what comes to mind for you because it sure as hell isn't Under Siege 2. I like the movie with Captain Kirk and Denzel Washington. That one was pretty good. Unstoppable is pretty good. Unstoppable is pretty good. Yeah. And I think the go-to, probably for both of us, is Back to the Future 3. Yes. I think Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade does a good job. I think that that Lone Ranger film, which is much maligned, in my opinion, rightfully so. It's really bloated, and it certainly feels like a spinoff of Pirates and et cetera, et cetera. But the train action sequences in that movie mwah, are yeah. fan goddamn tastic. Nobody in this movie, or at least <laughs> nobody in charge of this movie, aka Steven Seagal, sat down and said, what are the fun things we can do with a train? Go watch The General with Buster Keaton. That'll blow your mind how good it is. It's like, we got a train, let's do stuff with a train. As opposed to this movie, it's like, let's do Die Hard on a train and just stop there. They could have filmed this on a soundstage and had as much action and adventure with the train as they do in this movie. There's more action and adventure and throw mama from the train than there is in this movie when it comes to the train. You may be unsurprised to learn that most of this was in fact filmed on a soundstage. I'm not surprised by that at all. It's really unfortunate because the movie does nothing with its premise. You know, that's one of the big problems. But strangely, I have seen this movie a bunch. I've only seen Under Siege maybe one time. I've seen like Hard to Kill and Above the Law and like the early Steven Seagal movies when I was younger and it was like, oh, Steven Seagal, he's going to kick somebody. What's the one that he made with Kelly LeBrock? I think that's Hard to Kill. Yeah, I saw that at a dollar theater. I was like, this is okay. I mean, at the time, whatever. But I don't know that I've seen a whole hell of a lot of other stuff he's done. I'm the same way. Like, at a certain point, I realized that, like, oh, these movies are really stupid. And there are David Lynch movies in the world. And I should watch those. (laughs) Sure. Time is a finite resource. Why would I spend it watching this? And now we do this podcast. And again, I ask myself those questions regularly. (laughs) Yeah, well, it's just a function of age, I think. You start to realize, like, oh, ticka, ticka, ticka. I do think that this movie appealed to me because of Eric Bogosian. He has a lot of fun in this movie as the bad guy. Him and Everett McGill understand what this movie is and are approaching it the right way. And they have a good time. Mm -hmm. And Everett McGill in his own way, like he's really heavy in the movie, but you know he was like, well, this is going to be a real fun hoop. Yeah. Eric Bogosian, on the other hand, is just like, what if I just turn everything to 15? Yeah. And he does. And I think I've watched this movie as many times as I have because of him. And in fact, every scene that he's in, I mean, I'm not saying that it's good. I'm no, saying it's, not. It's, it's watchable. Sure. I agree with that. Whereas as soon as Steven Seagal enters the frame. It's like cinematic narcolepsy. You're just like... <laughs> 
Oh, oh, he's gone? What? Okay, I woke up. I talked about this a little bit when we discussed Chuck Norris, and which, by the way, Invasion USA, a million times better than this movie, just if you're keeping score at home. It's better in all the wrong ways. Like, it's dopier and stupider and more over the top, and that's what makes it... I would recommend that over this every day of the week. Oh, for sure. And just the stunts alone. It feels like stuff is actually happening as opposed to a guy on fire falling down some stairs and that's it. Yeah, and a bunch of shitty green screen and yeah. Yeah, but Steven Seagal kind of suffers from that same malady that Chuck Norris does where he just doesn't have any like charisma. He's not an actor, Bo. That's right. the problem. <laughs> yeah, but there are non-actors that have had charisma. Like if you've ever uh, seen the yeah. movie No Bad Land, there are plenty of amateur actors in that movie that are fascinating and compelling and they're not great actors but they're fascinating people that you want to follow david spade has a good bit about how easy it is to be an actor and how jennifer hudson lost on american idol and then a year or two later she got an academy award nomination and it's like that's like me going to the nba and i'm suddenly the mvp like hmm, it's not that hard just you know throw the ball put in the hoop <laughs> right <laughs> Yes, for all the people that are like, this is the highest form of artistic expression, I find that to be a little bit of bullshit. That's why I have such a grudge against Jim Carrey, uh -huh. because of the way that he approaches his method bullshit, where it's like, man, you're an actor, just do your job so that everybody that's holding the mics can get home on time. Quit being such a fucking diva. Again, that's the problem with this movie is that Steven Seagal was completely buying into his own hype at this point. Do you feel the same way about Daniel Day-Lewis? Yes. Okay. Just making sure we're not picking on people that talk out of their assholes as opposed to people who just talk out of their ass. No, anybody that creates an environment on a movie set that is anything other than professional. When it, It's my basic problem with people who are self-centered, and uh -huh. that's what it is. It's just like, I am such an artist that everyone has to cater to my whims, and I hate that bullshit. It's like, no, 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 we're all on the same planet together. We all have the same basic needs and emotions. So how about you cut the shit and we'll all work together and we'll do a good movie. And and like I said, be home at the end of the day to talk to our families instead of doing take 37 because you felt like there was an inflection you got wrong. Let's talk about this movie. Oh, yeah, we yeah. start off with what I assume is a deep cut from the Aaron Copeland bootleg series. It's this fanfare for the common man inspired piece of music, but it's written by composer Basil Polidorus. It's this mm -hmm. real like bum 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 bum. But it's a, a shuttle takeoff, so you're also getting the. Uh, here's the is uh, Enterprise. We are about to launch the takeoff. <laughs> Ba, ba, ba. Enterprise is Houston. Uh, you are go for launch. Ba, ba, ba. Three. Ba, two, ba, 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 ba. One. Lift off. <gasps> ba, ba, ba. Yeah. And you're like, what? Did I go in the wrong theater? Right. Like, well, this looks I, like I, a good movie. <laughs> <laughs> You get all the names of the people who are in our movie as a space shuttle blast off. And most of them have names that are very questionable plays on a Scrabble board. You're like, Catherine Heigl? Is that a real name? David Giannopoulos? Like, mm, okay. Zaphoid Beeblebrox? <laughs> like mr mizzleplex like i they're just making shit up right well except for nick mancuso who sounds like he has assumed that name to hide from the mob <laughs> <laughs> yeah just call me uh nick mancuso no big deal huh forget about it the movie kicks off and we're in fake outer space and this fake space shuttle is suspended weightless as a satellite is released into the growing expanse above planet earth that's home that's us <laughs> On it, everyone you've ever heard of, every human being who ever lived, lived out their lives, the aggregate of all of our joys and suffering, thousands of confident religions, ideologies, and economic doctrines, every hunter and forager, every hero and coward, every creator and destroyer of civilizations, every king and peasant, every young couple in love, every hopeful child, every mother and father, every inventor and explorer, every teacher of morals, every corrupt politician, every superstar, every supreme leader, every saint and center in the history of our species lived there on this moat of dust suspended in a sunbeam i don't get to do my carl sagan very often it's not good yeah but when i can wedge it in i do bo 
I understand. I do the same thing with Walken. <laughs> so we got a satellite in outer space up above Earth. Yeah, and this is kind of satellites the motion picture when you get right down to it. Uh-huh. But we then cut to the control center where the dad from that 70s show, who is the general, aka yeah. General That 70s Show Dad, mm-hmm. also was the guy who said, bitches leave in RoboCop, which is also pretty good. <laughs> This command center looks like every NASA slash military command center that you've ever seen in every movie ever. Think of your Jurassic Worlds, your War Gameses, your Arthur's Christmases. There's a Jumbotron on the wall. There's smaller stacked monitors on the left and right of the Jumbotron. Down on the floor, there's rows of computer with people wearing headsets, low lighting for dramatic effect. And Captains Gilding and Striller are manning their consoles and they're they announce that they have taken control of this new satellite and then we've got this other dude who works there jim the pervert yeah jim is a pervert because the first thing he does is like all right let's see what this baby can do huh and starts focusing the camera of this satellite on a beach Uh uh-huh oh he knows where he's going it's in brazil bo oh sure and so (laughs) he gets an image that you would say download from LimeWire in you know nineteen blah 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 blah. It's this kind of grainy looking picture of a woman computer enhanced, computer enhanced, rolled over onto her belly, and he sees her ass, and he's like, "Keep going, keep <laughs> going." Oh my gosh, she's turning over! Holy guacamole! That's what he says when he sees her bare breasts. Holy guacamole, dude! When he sees her breasts he acts like he has never seen breasts ever before he's just like oh my god yeah meanwhile general that 70s show dad is very pleased not just about the breasts but because it works it's a goddamn travesty right (laughs) so this satellite is there to take pictures of naked women without their consent is that what you're saying general that 70s show dad as far as we know at this point and jim the pervert is just like nasha thinks this is a weather satellite (laughs) <laughs> you're like oh god i mean that whole area is just going to be sticky and stinky gee i need to take off my pants i'm starting to chafe am i the only one guys boy you're sure getting a little hot in this control room huh fellas <laughs> Captain Gilder, the female accompaniment to, what's his name? Captain Trilling. She says, you know, Travis Dane, God rest his soul. He would have loved this. And then General, that 70s show dad says, Captain Gilder, you look upset. Something you want to get off your mind? And she says, you know, it's just that if Travis Dane was here, I sure miss Travis Dane. Hope he shows up later in our movie. And then we get the introduction of this new character, uh, Chain Smoking Tom who's Uh, chain smokes the whole movie he's always smoking and he says travis dane fuck that guy he was a nut (sighs) he drove his car into a lake and he died mysteriously (sighs) they never found his body but we all assumed he was dead i mean we all got a handwritten note from explaining how he died and how his body was cremated (sighs) it was all 100 percent legit am i right I mean, you know, he's dead, right? He's dead. And General That 70 Show Dad says, Well, he was crazy, but I did get a note from some guy today that said, Chance favors the prepared mind. (sighs) That's what Travis Dane used to say. (sighs) He probably mailed it to you before he died mysteriously in that lake and they never found his body. (sighs) God, I love nicotine. (sighs) Oh my God. (sighs) Did you know you could smoke five cigarettes at once? Oh, it's so good. So as they all take off after clapping themselves on the back for doing absolutely jack shit. I got naked pictures of lady on the beach. Holy guacamole. (laughs) Chain smoking Tom goes to make a little time with Captain Gilder, the lady. And he's like, so, uh, there's an air show and they have outdoor smoking areas. So uh you want to, you want to go with me? You know, we'll uh, have a couple of smokes, maybe a couple of cigarettes after you, if you know what I mean. No, I don't No. Oh, well, uh, I guess I'll just go home with this carton of cigarettes then. That sounds like a good idea for you. She says, like, I've already got plans. And Chain Smoking Tom gives her a real long look to stare at her ass when she leaves. Just to let you know what kind of movie this is where everybody that's a guy is super creepy about it. There's a lot of creeps in this movie. Yeah. We were five minutes in and we've already got holy guacamole naked breast and a guy hitting on his co-worker trying to get in her pants. And then we cut to... 
the hero of the movie, question mm. mark. Yeah, we're in Denver, Colorado, and we're in the alleyway between some buildings, and this bearded sous chef waddles out, and he's standing around, he goes, where in the heck is the star of our movie? And this car pulls up that has a driver, and from the back seat steps Steven Seagal to the angelic score of this movie to let us know that he truly is the hero and Hebo has arrived dude it's a full-on like he gets out of the car and turns bum, to bum, camera just to give you a bum, good bum, look bum, at him and everything oh it's the worst bum, 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 steven seagal ba, ba, ba. he knows karate he walks through the kitchen and of course everybody's like hey casey what's up casey how you doing casey good to have you back casey yeah steven seagal oh my god it's you oh my it's it's like what you would imagine when oprah shows shows up at O Magazine headquarters where right. everybody's just kissing her ass as she walks in. Hey, Oprah. Oh, it's Oprah. Hey, oh, girl. Where's Gail? Stedman something? Whatever. Please don't hit me with a brick. Yeah, it's what Ellen makes her crew do. Yeah. Like, if you come in and they're like, you, you didn't say, hey, Ellen. She hits him with a fucking sack of pennies. I'm going to come back in and everybody better say hello to me. Or I'm going to kill this puppy. Real quick, everyone was surprised that Ellen DeGeneres was a monster. Uh -huh. And she used to host a show where she brought contestants on and tortured them and giggled about that shit. No one should have been surprised that this woman was a an individual that took sadistic pleasure in watching people be treated bad. I assume everyone who is rich and or famous does that. Would you do that if you had all that money? Would you? Yeah, make of course. I mean, the, the rules don't apply to me anymore. What do I care? You know, if you've got enough money, the only time they can get you is if you've got one of them like Epstein Islands. That's the only thing that can blow that up. I'm just making sure you and I are on the same page. You are totally above the law at a certain point. This sous chef says, hey, what were you, a special ops or something? And Steven Seagal's like, eh, something, it's a mystery. And then he goes to the back office of this restaurant, which surprisingly doesn't have a hostess being sexually <laughs> assaulted or having her job threatened by the manager of this place. Let me just ask you this question. What is the point of him being at this restaurant at all? Because all he does is grab his shit that I guess he left in the office to leave. Is it just to pick up tickets? Is that why he's there? I think it's a tie to the first movie where he was a cook. Like, so now he has a restaurant and we get a lot of walk and talk. There's as he goes through the restaurant and he's talking to this sous chef, his buddy was like, hey, uh, Steven Seagal, I'm sorry to hear about your brother. We got to leave soon. If you want to make that train in 45 minutes, say, why are the two of you taking a train to California? California. And Stephen Seagal says, would you fly if your parents just died in a plane crash? And he's like, ah, that sounds like a something I probably wouldn't do. You know, my parents died in a plane crash. You know, my parents actually died when they parked their car in the garage of their house. and They left it running accidentally. And then the, the exhaust fumes killed them. I still drive a car, but I get your point. I, I see where you're going with that. You know, that's how Weird Al Yankovic's parents died. Oddly enough, my parents died the way same way Weird Al's parents die. I have, a, have that in common with Weird Al Steven Seagal. Uh, they also accidentally wrote a note that said this was all my fault. It was weird. Anyway. Sure enough, it's time to go to the train station after we drop that tasty bit of exposition. And at the train station, Steven Seagal is looking over the crowd because he's picking up his knees who he does not know what they look like. And also, let's be honest, probably just hunting a little young tail. Yeah, for the most part. He's wandering around, so he's picking up his niece, and he's kind of looking around. He goes from one person to the next, and then eventually, his niece comes up to him. Yeah, and it's Catherine Heigl enters the movie as Steven Seagal is at a ticket counter, and she's like, Hey there, Uncle Casey. Boy, it's been five years since we saw each other, and that's why I've got tits now, and you can stop looking at them, please. And he's like, <laughs> oh, well... You know, they're just good looking. They're kind of round and pointy where you want them to be. What have you been up to, Catherine Heigl? And Catherine Heigl says, um, I've been taking care of, I don't know, airplane crashes that just killed my dad and my mom. And by the way, my dad was like a military hero and I've been burying them in the ground and dealing with funerals and I've been grieving the death of my parents. Duh, what do you think I've been doing? Also, I cut myself to go to sleep every night. Thanks for asking, asshole. And also, the way this is shot when these two are talking, there is this bright splash of light across Steven Seagal's eyes to accentuate his emoting and not since Norma Desmond has one look 
set the screen aflame in such a way, Bo. <laughs> yeah, it's a real smoky gaze that he has. <laughs> uh, and while they're, you know, kind of grousing at one another at the ticket counter, very pointedly, we see the ticket agent typing into the computer, Casey Ryback plus one. Yeah. I also would just want to say, during the scene as they're getting their tickets to hop on the train to do non-train stuff, Steven Seagal is there with Katherine Heigl, and she looks like a 15-year-old girl that's dolled up to go to a frat party trying to pass off as 22. But it's not working. Unless you're a creep, then it's totally working. If you saw these two traveling together, you would immediately think this is an Epstein slash Chris Hansen situation. For sure. It's like, this is human trafficking. She is an underage prostitute with this old man. He has paid for her company on this trip. A hundred percent. Her lipstick, her hair, her eyes. You need to call the authorities, young lady. Nobody seems all that concerned that she's underage at any no. point. No. Uh, except the bartender. God bless her. We'll get to her in a minute. Yeah. As these two head to get on the train, Steven Seagal says, Hey, I remembered that you like teddy bears, so I got you this bear. You might be too old for bears, but I got you a teddy bear. Yeah. And Catherine Heigl looks at this thing. She's like, what the fuck? Like, she's like, I was expecting you to pull out some wine coolers or maybe a mixtape or some duct tape. And she's like, thanks a lot, weirdo. And then Steven Seagal says, <gasps> I'm not trained for this. I do like the fact that we get to hear Steven Seagal use the phrase teddy bear about a thousand times. Did you think the teddy bear was going to play an important role in this movie? Like maybe it had a hidden gun in it or a transponder or a bottle of chloroform? It's hard to cast my mind back to the first time I saw it, but knowing uh, how bad this movie is, no. Catherine Heigl gets on the train, and she's stepped away from Steven Seagal, and she is immediately accosted by the train's porter named Bobby, who is played by Morris Chestnut. You mentioned him in the introduction. Mm -hmm. Fresh off his role as Ricky Baker in Boys in the Hood. Fantastic movie. Please see it. Don't watch this. Speaking of being always hard, <laughs> Bobby Zacks definitely like the Boys in the Hood in that respect. He is way too thirsty when it comes to Katherine Heigl in this movie. It is a level of aggressive banter that you get from a street hustler dealing three card Monty or a guy with a coat full of stolen knockoff Rolex watches. Yes. He like chases her onto the train like, hey, you better let me take care of your bags because I'm the porter. That's what I do. If I'm not carrying your bags, they're going to fire me. By the way, what is that pretty necklace you have? Yeah, between your big, beautiful breasts. Hopefully you're 18 years old or over because if that's the case, I probably just committed a crime. But anyway, my name's Bobby. Let me carry your bags. What do you want to do? She says, oh, that's a Navy cross. That was from my dad. This is mace i'm probably going to use this later in the movie and by the way my dad's dead and my mom's dead and i'm getting on this train and heading to california with my uncle steven seagal and i said all of that a second time for everybody who was late to the movie because they were out in the parking lot getting high which is not wrong for an audience for this movie <laughs> and finally she relents and gives him the bag so he follows her all the way to their compartment come on baby let me take you to your room let me take you to your room come on come on please baby baby please please baby baby please oh nice she's gotta have it reference <laughs> and then he asks her hey so are you in this compartment alone and steven seagal catches up just to say no she's in here with me it's my <laughs> compartment too and he's like oh so what if i paid you a little money could i get in on this or no nah. You don't understand. I'm her uncle. No, no, no. I get that. You're her uncle. Sure. We all have to put <laughs> labels on things here just to make sure everybody's cool. Look, I'm not a cop. You could frisk me. I'm not wearing a wire. Yeah. This is all legit. Well, I mean, it's not legit. But if I give you $75, would you leave for an hour and then come back and not say anything? How about I give you $50 and I just watch? <laughs> <laughs> outside the train we see captain trillion the guy from earlier in the movie was at military headquarters he's the handsome one and he had one of the codes to activate the satellite a little earlier he hops on the train and then following him is famous 90s era creepy bad guy extraordinaire peter green aka zed from pulp fiction or for those people that were only allowed to see pg or pg-13 movies dorian from the movie the mask starring jim carrey who Bo does not care for. Correct. 
the mask <laughs> or Jim Carrey. The train takes off and we're headed to California. Here we go, Bo. Toot toot. This is going to be a good time. We're riding the rails. We're seeing the heart, Lambo. Fly over country. That's what those big city elites call it. Captain Trilling goes to his room in the train and he finds the sexy Captain Gilder, who's half in the bag with a bottle of champagne. And these two start K-I-S-S-I-N-G, which one assumes will next lead to love, then marriage, and then a baby carriage. Or a little F-U-C-K-I-N-G. Because they are definitely there to bone. Mm, or maybe an A-B-O-R-T-I-O-N. <laughs> yeah, it rhymes with smush motion. <laughs> We cut to this military base where a team of mercenaries led by Everett McGill. Welcome back to Pick 6 Movies, Mr. McGill. I'm sure you'll return many more times. As you mentioned in the intro, we last saw him being shot in the head by oversized fireworks and then a handgun by Gary Busey. Um, Why, Janie? <laughs> Say hi to your brother for me. These mercenaries, they barge into this military base, they shoot a few soldiers, and then, easy as peasy, they steal a couple of helicopters. It's amazing how they just pop in, fire off some machine guns, and then brrr, off they go with a couple of choppers. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, <laughs> back on the train, Catherine Heigl is drinking in one of the dining cars yeah. by the window, and Steven Seagal strolls up to the bartender, uh -huh. who could be any Playboy playmate. I think she was in Playboy, or Hustler. Or penthouse. I gotta go check my collection. And he says, hey, what is that little girl over there drinking? And did she put it on my tab? She's drinking tonic with lime. I'm like, she's drinking tonic with lime? Who drinks tonic with lime? I'll answer that for you, Bo. Somebody with a flask full of gin in their jacket. <laughs> That's who's drinking tonic with lime. So Steven Seagal drops a wink to the bartender and goes over to Catherine Heigl and says, hey, can we just... Have a pleasant conversation for once. I know you're not drinking. I talked to the bartender. She says she's drinking tonic water. Gross with lime. Grosser. Catherine Heigl is like, so how come you and my dad weren't talking? And Steven Seagal tells her the rawest shit where he's like, Hey, look, you know, things happen. I never thought we wouldn't have time to straighten him out, but he didn't get those medals of his by being a choir boy. He killed a lot. He did a bunch of dark shit to women, children dogs puppies the things are nightmares your dad was a monster and katherine heigl very rightfully is like why are you saying this to me steven seagal is like maybe it is time for a drink you know once i get a couple in me i'll tell you some real shit he did then comes one of the first moments in the movie where you're like what i don't think this is right where he says hey what's the hardest stuff you have yeah and she says well i've got puerto rican rum and you're like what that's the hardest shit you got at this bar nobody goes up to a bartender and orders the strongest stuff you got unless you're a drunk or you're looking to fuel your time traveling delorean because you got no gasoline like this doesn't make any sense at all b puerto rican rum even even if somebody did ask you that you don't have any jaegermeister you don't have Ever any 151 clear. back there? Yeah, nothing. I've got a bottle of rosé. It's been watered down, you know, because of the ladies club. <laughs> yeah. oh, that sounds great. Give me two fingers. Give me one finger of that. The haunting strains of girl drink drunk begin as he drinks. Did I ever tell you when my son was little and we would give him milk or apple juice, we had him tell us how much he wanted with his fingers. <laughs> so we would pour <laughs> beverages for him be like, do you want two or three fingers? of milk or apple juice because we hoped that we would send him out into the wild like to daycare or whatever and he would say give me three fingers of apple juice uh-huh it's pretty good <laughs> that is the uh direct path to drinking white russians Catherine heigl meanwhile <laughs> strolls back up to the bar and is like geez uncle steven seagal i want to get along i've had a sudden change of heart and inexplicably want to be friends now i'm just going through some things you know what with my parents being dead and all and this whole time though she's darting her eyes at the bartender and it really comes across as a signal that Catherine heigl is in danger <laughs> and that this man is anything but her uncle it's like <laughs> hey uncle steven seagal wink wink i decided that i wasn't gonna fight with you anymore help me i'm just gonna go back to the cabin where you've got all that loose cash in small denominations <laughs> and so as she goes for this roll up on the train uh -huh. we see helicopters approaching the two stolen ones from earlier right and morris chestnut because he's been stalking Catherine heigl as well 
starts flirting with her about like you know i can't let you in this closet right here behind me because if i did that i'd have to kill you and she's like oh you think you could like he wants to do a little play wrestling aka get to first base without having to make any moves yeah she offers up her forearm and she's like go ahead try and restrain me and this whole thing it really feels like dialogue that's headed toward let's have sex berg right but she's a child in this and it's uncomfortable and then bobby the porter places his hand on her wrist and she like immediately does this Vulcan nerve pinch that brings him to his knees. And then Catherine Heigl, who's like a buck oh five, she just picks up this grown damn man who's easily 180 pounds, tosses him in the air as though gravity has no meaning. He does a full somersault in the sky and then crashes down on his back in this narrow hallway of a passenger car. Bullshit. Meanwhile, back at the bar car. Steven Seagal is writing his memoirs in the same way that people write screenplays at Starbucks, a.k.a. for the attention. <laughs> yeah, and the bartender is like, oh, what's that? I, are you old enough to be writing your memoirs? Yeah, I'm just putting down my life experience. The working title is uh, Excuses to Avoid Family Funerals, specifically of your brother. And Bobby the Porter rolls back in, holding his back like an old man. Yeah, he looks like Fred Sanford. Just like, God damn. Oh, what'd you teach that niece of yours? She's Miss Bruce Lee. She almost killed me. Give me some booze. I know it's against the rules, but fuck it. I don't like his job anyway. <laughs> yeah, and he asked the bartender for a shot. It's like, brother, you're on the clock. Yeah, if I don't give a shit, what are they going to do? Throw me off? Fuck these people. <laughs> we also get a shot of him using the dumb waiter to tell the dumb audience what this is and where. And you think that's going to come into play, which they use it later, but it doesn't really matter. And then... Steven Seagal says to the bartender, Hey, be sure you don't give him any of that brandy. That's for the cake. Dude, Steven Seagal is just a passenger on this train, Bo. He's not the train's cook. Also, why wouldn't you bring your own brandy? Nobody on the train even knows who he is. He's just some random weirdo traveling what's clearly, possibly, most likely a teenage prostitute. He's not some celebrity chef. So, of course, we cut to Steven Seagal whisking some vanilla cake batter. And I would bet a thousand dollars this was the first time that Steven Seagal had ever used a whisk. I love the fact that as he whisks up this batter, uh -huh. he then just throws this cake pan into the microwave and hits potato. No, he puts it in the microwave in a glass pan and he goes, yeah, you just put it on high for 15 minutes. Like, what the fuck? You what? Dude, at most, because I looked this up, if you're going to microwave a cake in a cup, three, four minutes tops, in a pan, it's like seven, eight, 15 minutes, you got a shit show on your hands, Steven Seagal. Well, he also backs this up with, it's up to God now. And I guess that is mostly how he cooks. It's mostly prayer-based cooking. The train rolls along, and suddenly we see some sparks come out from under the wheels. And we cut to handsome Captain Trillian and the sexy Captain Gilder, and they're having sex on the train. And we get a joke about how she had an orgasm and he doesn't realize it. You remember that? Like in the 80s, there were a whole bunch of jokes about like guys fucking women, and they didn't know when the woman had an orgasm or couldn't give them an orgasm. That's silly, because as we all know, women don't actually have orgasms orgasms right that was my point anyway we then see two goons flagging down this train because uh that's something you can do bo you just get out there and, and wave a stick with a piece of cloth on it the train comes to a stop and one of these goons is veteran actor jonathan banks who played mike on breaking bad and better call saul these two mm -hmm. goons they roll up and the conductors get off the train and one conductor says well hey there young fella what's going on and they say hey, somebody's been shot it's you <laughs> boom boom and they kill the two conductors. And then over on the train, Zed from Pulp Fiction, he starts firing off a machine gun and he tells everybody, get in the back of the train. And then Mike from Breaking Bad picks up the dead conductor's hat that he just murdered, puts it on his head, and he has this grin that says like, I'm going to go drive a choo-choo, <laughs> which he then does. I do like the fact that he picks up the hat as a little bit of a trophy. That makes me happy. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, and Bobby the Porter goes to hide in the baggage car. Yeah, because he's a coward. Because these helicopters just start letting off hired goons to get on the train. They like land and they just tick -tick 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 jump on the train to start pushing all of the passengers to the back. In fact, one of the hired goons yells at his grandma, who's with her granddaughter. He says, shut that bitch up or I'm going to kill her or something like that. I'm like, whoa, that's uncouth. When one of the mercs gets on the train, they're told like, hey, 
make sure that there was nobody hiding in this baggage car. And so they just spray bullets across all the luggage. Yeah. Somehow Bobby the Porter does not die. Yeah, I mean, he's like behind a case of Samsonite or whatever. The gorilla jumps on it. He can't shoot through it. Meanwhile, in the kitchen, uh-huh. one of the cooks gets shot yep. as a dude busts in. And Steven Seagal then just kicks this shooter in the dick and tosses him out of the train, which was the first time I was like, could this be good? And then the movie goes on to prove me wrong. I didn't feel that way at all. I felt this scene, there was no choreography. Steven Seagal just kind of wanders in and he just sort of punches a guy and then he like shoves him off. It's very unceremonious. There's no dry, cool turn of a phrase. There's no pithy puns. He just kind of conks this guy on the head and whoop, off he goes. Well, but outside all these mercenaries see that one of their own has been thrown out of the dining car or the kitchen car. And so... They just start shooting this shit up, killing all of the cooks, by the way, because Steven Seagal didn't think to say, hey, I think maybe all of you should duck. No. And so he gets down on the ground and everybody else gets murdered. <laughs> and then Everett McGill and our real hero, Eric Bogosian as Travis Dane, they show up to get on the train, uh -huh. which at this point, I'm like, all right, now we got something. Right. They look like bad guys. We got the creepy number two in Everett McGill and we got our main bad guy the brains of the operation in this character Travis Day the train starts rolling again premise established terrorists are have now taken over this train Steven Seagal is hiding in the kitchen dining car waiting for his 15 minute microwave vanilla cake to show up burnt bing oh no it's way overdone. God hates my cake. I said, <laughs> let God take care of it. And he fucked me right in the ass. I hate God. I'm an atheist now because of this terrible cake. I'm going to Buddhism. Take that, God. This henchman goes down and opens up the door where our two sexy captains are having sex. Well, one of them's having an orgasm. The other one's not. And then he fires his gun and blows up their boombox, destroying what I'm assuming is a lovely mixtape filled with romantic songs that he made for her. Back in the kitchen, Steven Seagal appears from this cooler where I think he was hiding. Yes. Um, maybe that was smart. Maybe he was coward. I'm going to give him benefit of the doubt here. He steps out and sees all the dead cooks everywhere and he goes, this i'm trained for I'm like all right great so travis dane goes to find these two horny captains in their cabin uh-huh and i like that everett mcgill <laughs> says you two put something on uh-huh and travis dane says wow here you are last place anybody would expect to see the two of you and he gives them a big thumbs up like good job fucking each other and then he walks off there's a great moment in, in a minute with it but so they're led to a car where Travis Dane is setting up his command center. You two have been really naughty. There are rules against employees getting involved with each other. What other kind of rules are you two going to break? At one point, Captain, well, one, the guy captain, whichever one that is, sure. he says, is that what this is all about? Travis Dane says, oh yeah, I got a paramilitary group to hijack this train just to deal with you two. Because right. you two were fucking. Do you really think that's what I'm worried about? And so instead he gets on the horn to the rest of the train. Uh-huh. And he's like, I'm Travis Dane. I have now taken over this train. And guess what? All of you are now my prisoners. But none of you will be harmed unless any of you start some hero shit. So no hero shit. If any of you do anything stupid, federal regulations require that I kill you. <laughs> I kid, but seriously, I'm going to kill you. Tip your waitress. Anyway, Steven Seagal, as this is going on, he's just wandering around the train bow doing nothing. Sees the teddy bear he got for his, quote, it's the niece. the bear I bought. You know, like bears, Winnie the Poohs, your Paddingtons, your bears in the big blue houses. I love all kinds of bears. This one's probably not as good as the other bear she has. Then we go to Travis Dane as he is threatening Gilding, the dude, with this red hot needle. And he's like, I need you to give me the codes. And if you don't, I'm going to pierce your eye with this red hot needle. Well, I'm not going to do it. I'm going to have a henchwoman do it. <laughs> right. She's going to stick it in your girlfriend's eye. How about that? Give me the code to access the satellite. Because earlier we saw the two of you having your codes and you typed them in at the same time and I need both of your codes. So I'm going to pop your eye like a piece of popcorn or you're going to give me the code. What do you want to do? See your girlfriend's eye explode or give me the code. 
Just give me the coat. I like the fact that he explains it in detail where he's like, I bet you're wondering what happens when I stick you in the eye with this thing. I'm well, not first, wondering that at all. It pierces the surface of the eye and Please goes stop. into the gooey center. No, then thank it you. heats that part up and it boils. So your eye just explodes out of your head. I believe you. Well, are you going to give me the code? Absolutely. Here it is. One, seven, eight, five, two, three, seven, five, five. Oh, well, that was much easier than I thought. Okay. What about you, lady? Are you going to give me the code? Absolutely not. Never. All right. Well, we're going to stick this needle in your boyfriend's eye. Six, one, four, three, two, eight, nine, four. All right, here we go. And so while this is happening, <laughs> Steven Seagal is kind of watching while Everett McGill and his dudes are all searching through the cabins. Wait, he's watching from where? A corner or something? Okay. Or one of the cabins? That's one of the fundamental flaws of this movie. Steven Seagal's character in this film never knows what the bad guys are up to. Unlike in Die Hard, where Bruce Willis's character gets the inside skinny on what What's going on in this movie he's just kind of like he's outside the train he's inside the train he's wandering around even until the end of the movie i don't think he ever knows what the bad guys are up to with their earthquake satellite and so travis dane while steven seagal is lurking around the train is explaining his evil plan aka the plot of the movie which is i'm going to hijack this satellite that i created then i can use that as a weapon yeah. While he's doing that, Steven Seagal climbs out of the train onto the roof while Travis Dane is doing his clickety clack shit and hijacking this satellite. He types in both of the codes at the same time, one with his left hand and one with his right hand. Yes. And it's a real hot rod showmanship bullshit move because truly, if he had the two codes, he could just have a friend type one in while he types one. He doesn't have to do it at the same time. Eh, but it lacks panache. All right. I agreed. So Travis Dane hijacks the sideline and says, guess what? I've locked ATAC out. That is the group of people that you saw at the beginning of the movie. Also, you can get rid of these two captains. They've outlived their usefulness. Yeah. And they just throw them off the train. It's real good. Yeah. The, the dummy in particular that they use for the lady as they throw her off of the train as the train is going over a trestle. Uh-huh. And you just see this mannequin fall out of it. It's quite good. <laughs> it's a real Super Dave moment. Oh! <laughs> And Steven Seagal watches all this. He's just like, you sons of bitches. Travis Dane does hold up a CD-ROM and he says, This CD can contain the secret codes of outer space weapons. Or maybe it contains leather bondage porno. Technology can be used for beauty or debasement. Or maybe both. Wink, wink. And he puts it in and he says, well, what do you know? It's the targeting codes. And as the audience member, you're like, okay, I don't know what that means, but all right. Sure. And meanwhile, Everett McGill, as the head of this paramilitary group, is kind of doing his tour of the train, and he finds the open window that Steven Seagal slipped out of, and he gets on the horn, and he's like, I thought I told you assholes to make sure that all the doors and windows were locked. Sorry, boss! You're gonna be sorry if I find another open window. Yeah, and Steven Seagal, our movie's hero, he's just walking around on the top of this train doing nothing, and yeah. we were a good third into this movie and steven seagal has done nothing but clonk a guy on the head in the kitchen of a train that's it thereby causing the death of all the innocent cooks inside the car that he was in yes travis dane uses his hacking technology and he moves in on this satellite and then we cut back to nasa military control room and uh, general that 70 show dad says what the hell's going on with my satellite we use this to look at naked women on the new beaches of south america look get me captain gilder and captain trilling what do you mean his phone's dead and it's riddled with bullets and her phone's at the bottom of a river what the hell's going on here people so travis Dane announces to his henchmen hey guys you know that satellite that inspired the place in france where all the naked ladies dance and more specifically that hole in the wall where the men can see it all well guess what it's under my control and not only can you look at boobies you can make earthquakes with this thing guys at the control room they can't find this satellite because jim the pervert says well we made this satellite to be undetectable so now we can't detect it while that's going on steven seagal busts into the luggage car he crawls around the outside of this train like donkey kong jr and he just like opens up hatches and pops into cars and in and out of them none of it is believable or matters the fact that he left the train and then immediately comes back in the only thing that does is let everett mcgill know that there's an open window 
When he opens up the luggage car, Bobby the porter sees him and just screams. And he says, I thought you were one of those ugly motherfuckers with the guns. What the fuck are you doing up here? I was like, first off, swab the deck, sailor. You kiss your mom with that potty mouth. Second off, why is he insulting the goons as being ugly? Everybody's beautiful in their own way, bro. And so Steven Seagal says, I'm going to go find a phone. What's behind the store? Is your luggage all right? I'm going to leave, all right? On his way out, he's like, hey, look in all that luggage. See if you can find anything that can be used for a weapon. Meanwhile, back at the control room, the satellite starts transmitting images again, and they realize, oh, this plant in China is being targeted. Yeah. We come back to Travis Dane, who says, do we have investors on the line? Fan-damn-tastic. Hand me the phone. Gentlemen, in Asia and India, or wherever we are, how are we doing today? Listen up, fellas. I'm going to use this satellite technology to cause an earthquake in China. Watch very closely for the next 10 minutes. There's a whole monologue he gives here about how, you know, they called him mad at the academy and shit as he's hacking the signal into the control room. So it's like, guess what? It's me, Travis. Travis Dane, I'd like you to keep your eye on this plant in China as I blow it up. And then there is stock footage. Actually, it's footage from the movie uh, on Frozen Ground, the previous Steven Seagal movie. Is it really? It totally is. Yes. And (laughs) then on the screen, after seeing this model catch fire, the words chance favors the prepared mind flashes up, which is the shit that Travis Dane always used to say. And General That 70s Show Dad says, oh my God, get me Admiral Bates. You remember in the movie The Toy when there was that character named Master Bates? Uh Uh-huh. That was funny. I think in retrospect, there's a lot of problems with that movie. (laughs) You mean a movie where Jackie Gleason plays a rich white guy who buys a black man to be his grandson's toy? Oh, no. I was thinking of something else, but that too. (laughs) Anyway, back on the train, Travis Dade says, I'm going to hit the Pentagon and God willing and Yahweh and maybe a couple of uh, them other pantheon of gods. The nuclear storage underneath the Pentagon will create a cloud of radiation that is going to take out most of the eastern seaboard. Uh In return, I'm asking for, wait for it, one billion dollars. Bum, bum, bum. And Everett McGill says, a billion dollars? And he says, what? I owe some people some money. Steven Seagal goes down to this payphone on the train. It's all busted up. You know, the way most payphones were busted up. <laughs> and then we come back to NASA military HQ and Admiral Brates, he shows up. Although moments ago, he said that he was attending this air show in Colorado. Maybe the air show was topside of this secret facility. And they explained that the satellite makes earthquakes and that it has fallen into the wrong hands. And these hands belong to Travis Dane, who is one crazy son of a bitch. And the Admiral says, well, what the hell? would you hire a goddamn maniac like that and i was like that's a pretty good question i've been asked that at my work multiple times and tom the smoker says well because only a crazy person would build something like that i mean how else are you gonna get him on the payroll the admiral then takes command of the situation and he shouts out let's find the satellite and let's find this son of a bitch now finally some leadership at nasa military hq They also tell him, like, oh, we kind of hid all this from Congress, so we we gotta keep this on the down low. We've got full deniability that we blew up part of China and all. Admiral Bates is none too pleased about any of that. So back on the train, Steven Seagal, from his, like, carry-on, pulls out a gun? I mean, talk about a different time. I thought he found it from luggage just in the travel compartment. I think it's his, because it also has his PDA. It's an Apple Newton bow. (laughs) <laughs> yeah remember that <laughs> so he clips of wires to this apple newton and <laughs> as he's trying to get it going he goes no power Bo, there is a better chance of steven seagal using an apple newton to connect to a payphone to make a call as there is of an actual E.T. getting a speak and spell saw blade and umbrella to contact actual aliens from outer space. Oh, that was a good game. <laughs> I never saw the movie, but I played the video game. Back in our bad guys, there's some thug who says, Hey, say boss, some guy wants to blow up a plane with his cheating whore of an ex-wife on it. And Travis Dane says, Hmm, tell him I'm busy. I'm busy. I've got bigger things to blow up, like the Pentagon and a nuclear facility. Eh, the boss says he's busy. What? All right, right. I'll tell him. Hey, boss, 
He says he'll give you a hundred million dollars. A hundred million, eh? You know what? I'll do it. This is another one of those scenes that I find really kind of charming because of Eric Bogosian's performance. Because uh-huh. he's like, after he say like, I, I'm too busy. When he goes, a hundred million dollars. Well, if he's got the transponder codes, an earthquake in midair sounds like kind of something fun to do. <laughs> but i like that he's kind of gleefully evil you know he is the best part of this movie he's having a good time and if you ever watch it he's the only reason to do so steven seagal is down at the space phone trying to rig up his apple newton so that he can make a phone call and he goes into his saved numbers and he clicks a phone number for the mile high cafe and i get that this restaurant is in denver and maybe that's why it's named that but all i could think about was how many people are fucking in the bathroom of this place (laughs) yeah i joined the mile high club in the bathroom (laughs) of the mile high cafe i get it hey danny you're on bathroom detail that's your closing work shit 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 (laughs) anyone you're gonna be mopping there danny yeah there's six bottles of clorox in the back three mops if you need a lot of sandpaper you know where to find it (laughs) You're going to go through two mop heads. That's a given. (laughs) I'm sending you with four. So Steven Seagal has now turned the power back on in this car, clipped his Apple Newton to a broken phone line. Uh huh. And is getting a busy signal at his cafe All while right. the money hits Travis Dane's bank in his mobile control room. And the real control center at NASA or whatever realizes, oh, the satellite has now come back online and we're going to scramble some bombers to shoot it down. Which is what they do. They blow it up. But it turns out, Bo, they blowed up the wrong satellite. Travis Dane is thinking three moves ahead of him because he's busy blowing up cheating whores on airplanes. You give him the transponder codes, he's got to take care of. And so Everett McGill notices that the power is on downstairs and he's like, I thought you said all the power was off. Go down there and check on it, one-eyed mercenary. And so this one-eyed mercenary goes down the spiral steps from their control room to this passenger car, and he goes to the spot where Steven Seagal had been splicing all this shit together, finds the Newton, and as he's looking at it, Steven Seagal punches this one-eyed dude Uh while up top, Travis Dane is in the process of blowing up the plane. Right, right, with the cheating whore on it. Yes. Yeah. And so after the planes that NASA scrambled or, you know, the general scrambled to blow up the satellite, they're like, wait a second, we hit something. Why didn't we shoot down the satellite? Because clearly there was this plane that got blown up by Travis Dane. And that is where we cut back to Steven Seagal, who has now set his Apple Newton on a constant redial Mm -hmm. for the kitchen where he works. Yep. And then he hides the body of this one-eyed mercenary like you're playing Hitman. Right. (laughs) And then he slips back to the luggage room to just see what Bobby the Porter found. Which, it turns out, is nothing. And in the one line that makes me laugh from Steven Seagal, he goes, You about a useless some bitch, ain't you?" (laughs) Which is all right. (laughs) Bobby the Porter does find a gun and a change of clothes. And Steven Seagal gives him some instructions on how to use a gun. Like you need that. It's like, you turn off the safety, point the gun. This is the trigger. Put your finger in there, you pull it. Bullets come out this end. And then the bullets go through the people. And then when they go through, it kills the people. You got it? This is, though, the, the stuff that gives, like, action movie fans a hard on when he's doing that paramilitary like when you're pointing the gun be sure you're checking your directions 10 o'clock 12 o'clock 1 o'clock 2 o'clock don't ever point the gun any place you're not looking that's good advice that's good advice man that's fucking second amendment shit it's in the constitution it's that kind of thing somewhere at some point some militia asshole has said the same thing to a training class of equally dumbass militia types back at military hq slash nasa headquarters travis dane he magically appears up on the big jumbotron with a background of the eiffel tower behind him and all the military brass give it oh shit what the hell is that and travis dane says bonjour assholes you thought i was dead remember you fired me now you're probably asking what did we just shoot down you know you blew up a satellite what was the nsp1 the only satellite that could find me i'm always thinking six moves ahead of you 
dickheads. And I've also scrambled the signals of all these other satellites. You're going to work through 50 ghost satellites to find the one satellite that I'm using to find cheating horrors on planes and blowing them up and creating earthquakes in China. Go fuck yourselves. I like that he signs off by saying, I was smarter than you when I worked there. I was smarter than you when I left, and I'm smarter than you now. So right. you can all suck it. And if you want to know who took a shit in the tanks of all the toilets, it's me, dickheads. And I also like his Zoom Paris background that he's using. It's, <laughs> it's very like good. the Pee Wee Herman picture phone. <laughs> yeah, it's really good. And so Everett McGill and Mercenary Number One are looking for their one eyed friend that they sent down. Uh, they call him Milky. <laughs> As they're looking for that, we cut back to the control room where Admiral Bates is telling Jim the pervert, hey, w uh, what were you just saying there? And Jim the pervert is like, I was just saying that's why they call it space. And Admiral Bates says, what? That's why we can't find the satellites. That's why it's so hard to find. It's called space because there's so much of it. And Admiral Bates says, you know, you'd be doing me a big favor if you just shut the fuck up for the rest of this movie. <laughs> <laughs> It's a, a pretty quality scene. I'm <laughs> paraphrasing to some degree, but not a lot. No. Then the movie decides to remind us that Katherine Heigl is in our film, where she's in one of the passenger cars, like the last two cars on the train. She's on her knees. She's got her hands behind her head. She's next to that female bartender that was in Penthouse or Playboy or Jugs or Wii or some other magazine that my dad hid in his closet. And <laughs> Katherine Heigl tells her new bartending gal pal, this is a Navy cross and I wear it on my neck. It belonged to my dad. He's dead and my mom's dead. But anyway, Stephen Seagal, who didn't go to my dead dad's funeral, he's got like two of these, and he's got a bunch of other medals that are super secret. He's got a lot of secrets. He's my uncle. Wink, wink. My dad's dead, and so is my mom. Did I mention that? Wink, wink. Help me. Wink, wink. I hate so much that the line she has on the back end of this scene is, he'll save us because my uncle's a hero. Ugh, God, this is just the worst. And so we cut over to Everett McGill, who is kind of searching the cars with his men, and uh -huh. he finds some blood. How is that a clue, Bo? They've murdered multiple people on this, and he finds a little dollop of blood, and he's like, we got ourselves an intruder on our train. I think it's the freshness, maybe? Or he tastes it as like, no, 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 yeah. That is definitely Milky's blood. <laughs> He's able to identify all of his henchmen's blood by taste. Gross. He's a professional. And so <laughs> Steven Seagal, meanwhile, finds this busted-ass radio and has to look through the manual for a second yeah. to see if he can figure out how to work it, which I really like, where he's just like, I have no idea what the fuck this is. And then one of the henchmen that was hanging out with Mike from Breaking Bad, he shows up in the engine car where Steven Seagal is reading this manual, and he sneaks around the corner and then Steven Seagal pops up and puts a gun to this guy's chin and then blows this henchman's brains out onto the wall. It is gruesome. And then he just tosses this dude's corpse out the window. Yeah, grabs a flare gun, end of seed. <laughs> So Everett McGill, who is now sniffing his way through this car. He's like licking specks of blood. <laughs> yeah. And they finally open up the closet where Agent 47 stashed their pal. And he's like, <laughs> well, it looks like we've got an intruder. Oh, did I say that already? Well, we definitely have. Look, I found a body. Also, this guy at the front of the train is missing too. When I tried to radio him, I got no word. We need to check the route everywhere. Yeah. He sends a bunch of men up to check to see if anybody's on the top of the train. And sure enough, as soon as a dude pokes his head up, <laughs> Steven Seagal is there. <laughs> Steven Seagal just pushes this guy in front of the train, which is pretty good. And he gets caught under it. Yeah. Like a bread tie in a vacuum cleaner. It's a real da 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 moment. Again, there are moments when this movie shines, and it's usually when you're throwing a dummy off a train or under the train. <laughs> And so Steven Seagal ends up getting a firefight. He shoots some guys in the front car. Did you like how when they shot their guns, it was just kind of a spray and pray? They just like hooked their arm over the edge or around the corner of a train car and just let ammunition flow. I mean, if you got it, 
that seems like the safest way to deal with this, in my opinion. That lady henchman who is all into sticking hot needles into people's eyes, mm -hmm. she shows up and she has a sniper rifle and she seems to know what the hell she's doing. And she sees Steven Seagal across the way. She aims in and shoots him in the shoulder. And Steven Seagal goes down. See you later, Steven Seagal. Our mercenary number one, that Peter Green dude, shows up to investigate the spot where Steven Seagal was, sees some blood there, and kind of radios like, yeah, we got him. Steven Seagal is dead. Uh, just like Zed. <laughs> Everett McGill lets everyone know, like, well, we got a man, but he took out six men. Catherine Heigl overhears all this because the henchman's in the back with all of the hostages. Mm -hmm. and she's like oh shit my creepy wink wink uncle's dead and then we cut to outside the train where the camera pans down and we see steven seagal inexplicably holding on to the metal beneath a train car that is speeding down the rails and while steven seagal is holding on for dear life as this train rockets along the track oh shit my shoulder hurts like fuck i just got shot by a sniper rifle my biceps are really gonna be on fire tomorrow <laughs> We cut back to Everett McGill, who's like, I wonder what that man we shot was doing downstairs. Bo, my note here is that this movie is like watching three TV shows at once and just constantly changing the channel from one to another. <laughs> it is manic in its editing. Yeah. You do not stay with any scene long enough to really focus on what's going on. It's a click, 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 click type of movie. It's difficult to follow. I mean, not really. It's like, just please focus. On right. what you're doing. Let this scene happen, then go to the next scene and let that scene happen. They yeah. don't. Yeah. It's like you get like half a sentence and you just interrupt it to bounce off to some other thing that's going on. Back at the command center for NASA, yeah. they have now put together the fact that Travis Dane is probably working with Everett McGill. And Tom the Smoker is like, so what? Who cares? Who gives a shit about Everett McGill? And they're like, well, he's actually incredibly dangerous. <laughs> You know what? He used to be some soldier of fortune freak. He used to run a war camp down in Alabama where they ran around playing paintball. Isn't that fucking crazy? That's actual dialogue from this movie. They said that <laughs> yeah. Everett McGill was a soldier of fortune freak who ran a war camp in Alabama where they played paintball. Part of that sounds like a really good time. And it's not the part you think. <laughs> Sure enough, Everett McGill sniffs out that Steven Seagal was trying to use this Apple Newton to transmit something off the train. And sure enough, he did. Like, he sees where it was successful. And the married to that, we see a fax printing out at the Mile High Cafe. Where his sous chef is waddling around looking for something to do. Which, at least as far as scenes go, is a complete thought. Hey, I found this thing. It said it was successful. Cut to seeing the thing be successful well a broken clock is right twice a day but <laughs> meanwhile speaking of broken clock steven seagal has made his way back to the luggage car hey bobby the poor what are you doing here did you figure out how to work a gun safety trigger bullets kill people and bobby the porter is like holy shit you got shot and he goes what this you think this be a shot this ain't being shot no it is being shot you got shot by a sniper in the shoulder that's being shot dude that is the whole scene is just him saying, this ain't being shot. It's mind-numbing. I just put a little band-aid on it. Put a little Neosporin, a little band-aid. It's okay. It's like a mosquito bite. This went through and through. I mean, it shot another guy behind me, and he's dead now, but this ain't shot for me. You ever had a sweat bee sting you? It's like half that. It's nothing. So in the control room on the train, Travis Dane has decrypted Steven Seagal's PDA because he just used the password Steven Seagal. Right. Well... This just looks like a collection of recipes. Hey, this sounds pretty good. Also, here's a book he's working on called Ryback's Tactics. And as soon as he <laughs> says this name, everybody else in the car is like, Ryback, did you see Ryback? Ryback, Ryback, oh my god, it's Ryback. Are you talking about Casey fucking Ryback? You mean the greatest military paratrooper Navy SEAL? And Everett McGill says, do you mean Casey Ryback? <laughs> Casey Ryback, Casey Ryback, oh my god, Casey Ryback. You know, I heard that Steven Seagal plays him in this movie. He does. <laughs> it's Steven Seagal, that's his character. And then he looks at Peter Grade and says, when you told me that Steven Seagal had been killed, did you see the body? No, well, we didn't see the body. I mean, he got shot, he fell off the train, we're going very fast. By the time we got there, his body is gone. What would you want me to do? He gives him 
a smack in the chops for mouthing off like this. Why are you slapping me? A guy got shot and fell off the train. What did you want me to do? Assumption is the mother of all fuck-ups. You're the mother of all fuck-ups slapping people. I'm calling HR. I want a hard target search of this train. I'm sure you do, shithead. Fuck you, I quit. Ever dining cabin? Baggage car, kitchen, closet, outhouse, warehouse, <laughs> doghouse. Yeah. Oh, that's good dialogue. Write that down <laughs> for the next movie I'm directing. For the first time in the movie, we get a mention of the subtitle of the film. Which I still don't understand what's going on there. Okay. But, okay. Here's what it really is, and it Please. doesn't make any sense according to the film. So I'll be back in two minutes. There is a thing <laughs> called Dark Territory. From Harry Potter, right. No, it is an actual train thing, which is the period of time between essentially signal locations okay. where a train can't be contacted by signalmen. Okay. How does that relate to this movie, Bo? Uh, that's where we get into some fuzzy territory. <laughs> <laughs> because... In theory, you can't have any communication during this time, but that uh, doesn't really seem to be the case here. No. Because you're not accounting for cell phones and, like, it would just be the phone on the train that didn't work. Just. It's not like you go into a valley and nothing works. Stop. You know? It's because it's poorly written and edited and directed and acted and produced. It's just, it's garbage. All of our henchmen go off to look for Steven Seagal. We cut to outside the train where Steven Seagal and Bobby the Porter shimmy their way along the outside of the train once again we cut back to our bad guys where everett mcgill looks at the train's manifest and he sees that steven seagal is traveling with a plus one his quote niece pervert well, this is going to be extremely gross let's go to the passenger car and find uh, the youngest hottest girl steven seagal and bobby the porter they make their way back onto the train because they were outside the train they got to be back in it we come back to the restaurant uh, and the sous chef he finds the fax message from steven seagal and he reads the encrypted message and he says oh my god and i was like is he the cavalry that steven seagal was calling like he sent a message to his sous chef but okay so steven seagal and bobby the porter they make their way down this hidden corridor where steven seagal starts mixing random shit that he found together and bobby says man what are you doing and steven seagal says i'm making a bum with coconut oil and some like Splenda. nine volt batteries and a shoestring and, <laughs> yeah it's yeah it's a real macgyver nonsense and meanwhile yeah. Everett mcgill has in fact made it to the car where all the the passengers are being held hostage and he is just looking around for any whiff of a ryback uh-huh he sees katherine heigl you there with the navy cross around your neck i think you're the one i'm looking for he gives her a whole like what is your name and she says uh madelinson jeffertonson shabadoo <laughs> and he's like uh-huh what are you doing on this train and she says I work here? He's like, well, why aren't you in a uniform then? Um, I'm getting a ride home. I'm not actually on the clock. Fuck you, here's some mace! Psh! Yeah! And this is my favorite part of any Everett McGill scene in this movie, where he just kind of blinks for a second, and he grabs it from her, and he says, Why, wow, this isn't mace, Janie. This is pepper spray. Why, wow, after you get used to it. And he kind of gives it a, like, banaka. Yeah. <laughs> Why, wow, it just clears the sinuses. I put it on my egg. I put it on my balls in the morning to wake me up. So he starts to yank Catherine Heigl up. The bartender tries to play hero. You here. leave her alone! Yeah. Kapow! You're dead, bartender. Everett McGill just takes her hostage. Meanwhile, Steven Seagal is finishing up his bomb and he tells Bobby the Porter to get into the dumbwaiter, essentially. Uh -huh. And then he's gonna do a little Steven Seagal magic. He goes upstairs and he tosses this bomb at a henchman. It explodes and just sets this guy on fire who just ah! runs around in pain, setting the whole train car on fire. <laughs> 
dude it's got a beeper attached to it that actually makes the thing explode uh uh-huh. and when the guy catches it the beeper spells out you're fucked before it blows that's pretty classy yeah to your point though as soon as this guy catches fire and starts running around all crazy like steven seagal just kind of books back downstairs yeah and while he's running downstairs bobby the porter slips out of the dumbwaiter to grab the cd out of the computer because I guess they learned that there were targeting codes on this thing. How do they know any of this book? They don't know what the bad guys are doing. They don't know about the CD. They don't know about the earthquake machine. They don't know any of this, Bo. You're absolutely right. It makes no sense in the context of the movie. It's like we, the audience, told the good guys what to do. It's like a choose-your-own-adventure movie. Like, you guys should go stop them. They're up to no good. Okay, we'll believe you, audience. Travis Dane notices, oh, somebody grabbed the CD. The computer's down! The computer! computer's down people and everett mcgill meanwhile is ordering some of his men down after steven seagal one guy kind of hesitates and everett mcgill just pulls a gun on him is like i suggest you get down there and take care of this problem when the guy starts heading down the stairs steven seagal shoots him in the gut with the flare that he stole yeah that guy gets set on fire so he runs "Ah!" he just starts setting everything on fire and then another guy comes down the stairs and steven seagal just takes him down with some advanced thumb wrestling i was surprised he didn't bend over fart and set that guy on fire with a lighter around his ass cheeks (laughs) steven seagal and one of the mercenaries end up like scuffling and end up completely falling off the train Ah, thunk meanwhile bobby the porter is found and he jumps off the train too see you later the mercenaries are shooting at them steven seagal and his guy are hanging off a cliff and he ends up just knocking his mercenary down into the abyss right he is hilariously just stuck on the side of the cliff now the mercenary when he comes down he attached his rappelling rope to the train and that's connected to steven seagal so later when the train takes off it pulls steven seagal back up to the top of this cliff that's the second dude like oh. he knocks the first dude off and then another guy comes rappelling down and is like hey steven seagal give me the cd and he's like you guys are real stupid and he launches himself onto this guy cuts the cord so that he goes falling and then starts scaling back up the cliff bobby the porter runs off and another henchman gives chase after him and that henchman who thinks bobby the porter has a cd he says give me that cd or i'm gonna cap your black ass and i was like whoa remember in the 90s when racism was a real thing good thing we don't have that these days bo yeah look no further than the news for that (laughs) bobby the porter says i don't have the cd i dropped it down there and it fell into the woods the only thing i've got in my pocket is your ass and he turns ground pulls out a gun and shoots the mercenary and he kills him in self-defense good luck bobby if you go to trial i'm rooting for you buddy (laughs) but meanwhile everett mcgill is like now where did that porter go under the train hey what's that shiny thing down there well i do declare it looks like the cd was looking for and as he picks it up he kind of quotes the travis stain line of well what do you know chance favors the prepared mind this movie's so stupid all of this was completely meaningless so they have taken bobby the porter hostage he gets back on the plane with all the mercenaries and then they're just like well, we don't need Steven Seagal at all. He's off the train, to the best of our knowledge. So we're just going to cut this cord attached to the train, and then we're going to get the fuck out of here. Right. So, Which is what happens. But Steven Seagal, of course, grabs the side of the mountain just in time after Everett McGill shoots the bungee cord holding him up. And Bobby the Porter jumps back on the train, and Steven Seagal is now on his own off of the train and travis dane has his cd back so all of that has happened and travis dane then declares and now there's 20 minutes before i begin shooting up the pentagon with my earthquake machine so back in the nasa control room Mm -hmm. general that 70s show dad is telling all his underlings namely jim the pervert that they need to eliminate any of the satellites that could be over the pentagon in 20 minutes thereby cutting down the number of fake satellites we can totally blow up number 69 (laughs) shut up jim i thought we told you to shut the fuck up jim you did but my pants are off you can't fire me my dad works here what and they also dropped this little tidbit which is new to the movie movie which is they don't actually have to blow it up with a missile if they can lock onto the satellite they can send a self-destruct signal okay (sighs) 
back at Steven Seagal land. He finds a truck and he hot wires it and he steals that truck. Dude, he hot wires it with one of those like, I'm just going to lift the hood, rub these two wires together, and now it works. That's how you hot wire a truck, Bo. This movie I know, is so dumb. it's terrible. Is Steven Seagal aware that there is a satellite that causes earthquakes in China and blows up horrors on planes? He has no reason to know that, but <laughs> it, presumably he does? All he knows is the bad guys are on a train and he's trying to save his niece-ish? I think so. It's real confused. <laughs> And so they, <laughs> the NASA military group gets this message from Steven Seagal's chef. cook pal. Yeah. How does he know who to call? How does Steven Seagal know to call these guys at NASA Military HQ? Well, all right, because Admiral Bates and Chain Smoking Tom were from the first movie. Oh, so were they, they? Yes. They are oh. people that he has worked with before. Okay. So the idea is that the sous chef is calling them to say like, hey, by the way, Steven Seagal is on a train and they've got a military situation there where a bunch of knuckleheads got gotcha. control of it okay my that's me i didn't do the required reading i didn't know that these were characters that we knew that's fine because it now makes sense when the admiral says you mean to tell me that steven seagal is on that train the most famous navy seal arms expert karate fight professional ladies man living today scramble the stealth bombers we're gonna go blow up that train or something so they're gonna send some planes to blow it up regardless of the number of people on the train sure while that decision is being made steven seagal is chasing the train in this pickup truck yeah and we get a moment with everett mcgill where he's saying you know i kind of regret that casey ryback and i were not able to fight mano e mano uh, i'd really like to know what his blood tastes like he's talking with katherine heigl and she's like looking at him well she claws him in the face and like really digs in and he goes that was good yeah i got a bulge in my pants where you hurt me i'm a weirdo all right whatever well he pulls a gun on her and he's like it's too bad you're never gonna see your uncle again and travis dane at that point is like whoa whoa, whoa. hang on leave her alone she's insurance we need that sexy little 12 to 28 year old wow her uncle is dead he fell to his death did you see the body that you're assuming he's dead and assumption is the mother of all fuck-ups that's a callback everett mcgill somebody give me a rim shot dickheads i hate it when my words are used against me but i will <laughs> refrain from killing this underage girl for the time being we cut to steven seagal he's driving along this dirt road chasing the train in parallel and then he just drives the truck off a cliff but before that he shoulder rolls out onto the ground the truck flies over the train for no logical reason and then steven seagal just whoop, jumps back down on the train yeah and nobody on the train is like anybody see that truck just go flying over no 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 i mean i didn't see anything like that hmm all right well i guess that was me my fault we got to bobby the porter saying i should have never gotten back on this train and then zed from pulp fiction he shows up and zed says you're like a cockroach i'm gonna squash you get the gimp I'm like oh shit this is gonna be weird and he's about to kill bobby the porter and in fact gives him one of those tell me where you want it do you want to you want to see it coming or do you not want to see it coming mm -hmm. because either way i'm about to shoot you you want it in the forehead you want it in the back of the head or you want it in the dick just like in baby in usa i come from the richard ledge school of military <laughs> training where we just shoot everyone in the dick until they die <laughs> but before he can kill him Bo, yeah sure enough steven seagal has somehow snuck back onto this baggage car and ends up snapping the neck of this dude zed from pulp fiction dies yeah Zed's dead, baby. Travis Dane, he gets his $1 billion from somebody. We don't even know who. It turns out that he's like, you know what? I'm still going to blow up Washington, D.C. And then he does this Rod Sterling impression from the Twilight Zone. Where he says they're going into dark territory, which I thought they were already in. I didn't know what dark territory was. You explained it, but I've already forgotten. <laughs> and then they make their way past this abandoned ghost town. Steven Seagal looks at this map. He says, we're headed on a collision course with another trip. It's the Nevada Petrol Express. It's filled with gasoline, TNT, and nitrous, and illegal roadside fireworks. It's a powder keg ready to explode at any minute. It's being piloted by one of those weird headless bomb guys from Sirius <laughs> Sam. 
<laughs> These two stealth bombers show up to give chase. Travis Dane then exclaims he can't blow up the stealth bombers because then he would have to change the target from Washington, D.C. and he doesn't have their transponder number something something. Right, which is uh, what he used to blow up the other plane was the yeah. transponder codes. Right, and he with the cheating those. whore on it. Right. Right. So the NASA command center also has now realized that this train is on a collision course. With the Dynamite Express. Right. And somebody else says dark territory for no good reason. And Admiral Bates is just like, well, blow up that train. I don't care if you're blowing up Super Soldier, Casey Ryback, a bunch of innocent civilians or whatever. The only solution is explosions. Somehow Travis Dane hacks his way to blow up one of the stealth bombers. I didn't understand that at all. Yeah, he says he can't target the planes themselves, but he can use the meteorological radar to determine stop. where he, the planes were jesus christ how fucking stupid were people watching this movie <laughs> it's more satellite shit like i said this is just satellite the motion picture it's the satellite <laughs> that is killing everybody it's the fake satellites here's another satellite that does meteorology it's just a bunch of satellites steven seagal finds a hidden passageway into a woman's bathroom here he beats up a bad guy then he throws a knife at a different bad guy and kills him there's more shooting more bad guys die hostages scream bullets fly only one guy gets shot in the head everett mcgill shows up he's really pissed off and he heads to where all of the action is happening and by that i mean all of the random shooting is taking place all of this is quite terrible a second stealth bomber <laughs> finds the train and travis dane blows it up using the same bullshit technology that bo just explained to me that i didn't pay attention to <laughs> Steven Seagal then gets on a walkie-talkie and he says, Ever McGill, I'm coming to get my niece now. So does Steven Seagal know Ever McGill? And that he's on this train? And that he would be listening to this walkie-talkie? Yeah, because Everett McGill says, Well, wow, Casey Ryback was the man who trained me. So, yes. But how does he know he's on this train? I've trained a lot of people in my career. I wouldn't necessarily know they're on the train abducting my niece. Wink, yeah, wink. that's a good question. I'm not sure how he knows it's him. <laughs> like, I know, right. I know how he knows him personally. I don't know how he knows it's him. Uh, unless maybe he just heard his voice over the radio he's got. But <laughs> yeah, know. you need that moment in this movie where Steven Seagal is like, well, that's Everett McGill, my old student. Guess it's time to teach him some new tricks. Right. They don't do any of that. That's everything you need. Steven Seagal tells Bobby the Porter, you see the helicopter flying above with that long rope ladder hanging off of it? You need to go climb that rope ladder and then come into that helicopter. What? You want me to <laughs> what? Have you ever tried to climb a rope ladder? It's damn near impossible, man. Bobby the Porter has already cut loose all the passenger cars on the train, thereby saving all of them. Oh yeah, I forgot. It's an important detail. Sorry, I glossed over that. All of our hostages are safe, except did they grab Catherine Heigl? No, they no, yanked no. She's, her over. She's still on the train with Everett McGill. Right. But to your point, though, Bobby the Porter has already saved all of the hostages. His work here's done. Right. As soon as Steven Seagal is like, "I need you to shimmy up that ladder," and you can go fuck yourself, Steven Seagal. <laughs> right. Like I'm done, man. <laughs> I just saved all those people. But he stays on the train. And, does, and it's another groaner of a line where he says you're the hero Ugh, this is just the worst that female henchman who had the sniper rifle she shows up she gets on the train top and she gives chase and the helicopter's there with the ladder bobby the porter he beats up this woman or she kind of beats him up and then it becomes this like karate movie bobby uses the vulcan nerve pinch that he learned from katherine heigl earlier on this woman and then he just tosses her out of this helicopter she bounces off the train to the ground below so nice seeing you then bobby the porter goes over to the pilot of this helicopter he pulls out a gun and he says keep this helicopter in the air or i'm gonna blow your motherfucking brains out you cuck sucking motherfucking asshole shit dick asshole piece of shit fuck 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 and you're like why is there so much unnecessary profanity in this movie or this podcast i guess so sorry mom he is giving him orders to do the thing that he was going to do anyway which <laughs> is to hover over this train and wait for people to climb up this oh, ladder okay uh, that's what i was okay you're confirming my reservation essentially steven seagal is going after everett mcgill now and he spies this crudely made wire trap running across the aisle hooked to a grenade and so he sets it off on his way into the cabin uh-huh 
to i guess let the remaining mercenaries know like oh he's in that cabin and so a dude runs after him and he just kills that dude shoots him yeah. and he's dead the train speeds along and everett mcgill is now manhandling our main villain travis dane everett mcgill says i'm gonna kill steven seagal you take care of your techno bullshit motherfucker cocksucker fuck shit titties piss asshole butt cheeks booger doo doo well and this is everett mcgill's fondest wish is now i can fight him hand to hand and so he goes off to do his mono e mono thing with steven seagal uh-huh. and in the control room at nasa we see t minus 10 minutes until the pentagon is blown up uh-huh. jim the pervert chimes in he says admiral sir there are eight ghost satellites left if i had to pick one to shoot down i would shoot down number 69 Sorry, I'm at Kappa. And the Admiral's like, all right, well, shoot that one down. So they fire a missile at the Kappa satellite. And I don't know what happened to all the other ones. Because this movie just edits back and forth to crazy scenes. We come back to Everett McGill, who has emerged as the movie's alpha bad guy. And Mm -hmm. he puts a makeshift noose fashioned from what I think is a string used to lower and raise the window blinds. He puts it around the neck of Catherine Heigl so that she is now in danger, Bo. He also says to... To her, you know, your uncle is the only man that ever scared me. I like it. Yeah, he's a weirdo. He's super weird. But I again, this is what I'm here for. If I'm watching an action movie like this, I want a creepy, lecherous, mercenary weirdo as my villain. And I'm okay with all of this because he's the bad guy and he's about to die. Yeah. Steven Seagal calmly wanders through the dining car where he sees his niece standing with a rope around her neck. And Steven Seagal only has a gun in his hand for protection. And then Everett McGill, he pulls the pin from a grenade and he puts it in the hands of Katherine Heigl Mm -hmm. and says, it's you and me and me and her. It's you and me or me and her. Like, we're either going to fight or this grenade is going to go off. All right. And so they decide that this is a knives only map in Call of Duty. Yep. So they just toss aside their weapons and start scuffling with knives. Yeah. They beat each other around for a bit. It's all very unthrilling. Tables break. Glasses break. They tumble down some stairs. They end up back in the kitchen. Speaking of which, what happened to the cake, Bo? Oh, it's still on fire in the microwave. <laughs> I'm surprised you didn't pull that hard as a brick piece of flour Clonk and sugar. on the head. Right. Just use that as a weapon. I really also hate Steven Seagal's like wavy hands thing that he does when they're fighting. Like that finish him move. Yeah. He does that. Kapow! Not that, that you're right. That, that's the finish him move. But as they're fighting, he does that like his hands are like snakes in the air. Why? That bullshit. You never know when I'm going to strike. It's really stupid. But then, yeah, there's the finish him and he ends up snapping Everett McGill's neck. And then Steven Seagal tops it off by saying, like I said, nobody beats me in the kitchen. Yeah. We Ugh. see a one minute timer counting down and I wasn't sure if this was the timer for the earthquake satellite or the timer till our train crashes into the dynamite train that's headed towards them. I don't know. Travis Dane shows back up in our movie so that he can get killed. Catherine Heigl is there still with a noose around her neck. She's in peril. She's got a grenade in her hand. Travis Dane comes in and he says, well, I've got to be going and Catherine heigl says you take one more step and i'll drop this live grenade that everett mcgill gave me for some reason and then out of nowhere steven seagal shows up Catherine heigl does in fact drop the grenade and the grenade blows up but not much happens there's like some sparks and a couple of small fires but it's not a devastating explosion when she first says like i'll throw it i like the fact that he's like go ahead yeah. throw it and she's like uh maybe not but yeah eventually she does and then like it's the high explosives equivalent of the fireworks snake in terms of being one of the more underwhelming explosions you're ever yeah. gonna see it's a real dud meanwhile back at nasa control the missile fired at the kappa satellite has now missed and everybody's like oh son of a job. bitch jesus christ god damn god 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 god, god. Jim the pervert, you're the worst. Sorry. Sorry. I I guess I should have gone with the sexiest satellite. And Travis Dane, back on the train, is telling Steven Seagal, look, you can't stop me. There is nothing you can do to stop the fact that this train is going to collide with an explodey train and the Pentagon is going to be blown up. I've got everything right here on this laptop and none of it can be stopped. 
And so Steven Seagal just shoots the laptop. Yeah. And Travis Dane says, huh, I never thought of that. Yeah. And then collapses. The bullet goes through the laptop and through Travis Dane, our bad guy. And this for no good reason, causes all of the ghost satellites to disappear from the screen back at NASA control. And so they issue their self-destruct command to blow up the actual satellite. Is that what happens? Yes. I wasn't paying attention. Okay, that sounds pretty good. And then Catherine Heigl gets on the rope ladder to go up to the helicopter. Yeah, she climbs through a skylight. And why is that helicopter still over the... Tr All right, never mind, because they need to wrap this movie up. Right. And also, Bobby the Porter is holding a gun to make sure it doesn't go anywhere. Oh, that's right. So she climbs the rope ladder, but Steven Seagal doesn't make it in time. They have to pull up, and the trains run into each other and start exploding. There is a... Maybe the best action sequence in the movie is really this. Okay. Which is him running down the length of the train as it is, like, crumpling and exploding. And then, like, Nathan Drake, he just jumps off the back of the train as it explodes onto the rope ladder. You make that sound ten times better than it actually is. Of course I do, because I have a way with words. But also, it's still the best action sequence. It's not great, but it's the best thing in this movie action-wise. It was fun watching those two model trains crash into one another in oh, such yeah. a spectacular fashion that would give Gomez Adams wide-eyed giddy glee. Yeah, gave me glee. I enjoyed it. <laughs> and so Steven Seagal is almost to the tippy top of the rope ladder, is about to get in the helicopter when, surprise, surprise, Travis Dane somehow has survived all of this. He fell off the train with a gunshot wound through his chest uh -huh. and somehow got back up on the train In onto the ladder and climbed up to grab hold of Steven Seagal's leg. Yes, when nobody was looking. Surprise! <laughs> it's me. I'm here to do a Jason Voorhees Styles last scare. And Steven Seagal gets inside this helicopter as this fireball is rising into the sky. And Travis Dane is hanging on to the door of the helicopter. So Steven Seagal just slams the door slicing off the ends of travis dane's fingers uh -huh. while the fireball rises and consumes him yeah and he falls to his death see you later travis dane yeah and so steven seagal then just grabs the radio on the helicopter and says hey is this nasa what yes it is is this steven seagal you got it you'll go for ss Hey, I just want to let you know, the hostages are safe, and I was the only one who had anything to do with that. Hey, that's bullshit. This is Bobby the Porter. I saved all the hostages. Hang on one second, Ness. You shut your goddamn mouth. I didn't get this far by letting somebody else take credit for my heroics. This is bullshit. Fuck you. Shut up. I, you saw what I did to Travis Day. I will throw you right the hell out <laughs> into that fireball. Hey, Nasa, this is Steven Cigar again. <laughs> Just want to make sure that last message came through loud and clear that I was the one who did all of this stuff. And that's pretty much how it ends. And Steven Seagal puts a gun to the pilot's head. He's like, fly us back to someplace safe and make sure you tell everybody that I was the one who saved everybody or I'll kill you too. And we do hear Catherine Heigl say, Uncle Steven Seagal, I never doubted you. And he says, yeah, you did. <laughs> what? You lying, bitch. I know you didn't think I could do it. Give her and give me a hug. You want a teddy bear? You don't think I'll throw you out with Travis Day? I'll throw all of you. I know how to fly a helicopter. I'll throw every motherfucker out this place. At this point, they should really freeze frame the movie and roll credits like a shitty sitcom, but they don't. Instead, we get a final shot where Steven Seagal and Katherine Heigl put flowers on her dead dad's grave. And Steven Seagal's there wearing his Navy uniform, and we get some blues song titled After the Train is Gone, which has nothing to do with our movie other than it's got the word train in the title. <laughs> the end. Last train to Clarksville plays right after that. <laughs> that would be better. <laughs> a couple of songs by the band train <laughs> again i feel like this movie it is clearly a diehard knockoff 
But oh, it's so, absolutely. It's so tepid and misguided in what it's trying to do. On a scale of one to ten, from the how well did you rip off Die Hard? This is like a two or a three. Like they didn't even hit the beats and the notes. It's really misguided. Yeah, it's really unfortunate because there is a world in which the Die Hard on a Train formula totally works, and you've got pretty good villains in this movie. Sure. It's just you're saddled with Steven Seagal, who is uninteresting as an actor, and the action scenes aren't very good, so what does that leave you with, you know? Under Siege 2, that's what it leaves you with, just crap. It's a real bummer. This movie should have been better because all of the pieces are kind of there, except for Steven Seagal. Like, that is the thing that that makes everything go wrong in this movie. What What are you gonna gonna do? do? But for our next episode, episode two of this season, 19, is that where we are? Uh, yes. Season, season 19. 19. I'm going to do something I've never done before, Bo. Would you like to tackle Die Hard on a cruise ship? Or would you prefer to tackle Die Hard in a prison? Ooh, you know what? Let's it's up say- to you. I, I know. Choose wisely. Do we get one later? Or is this an either or? And You know, is this a, a, a loser leaves town match? No, I'm just going to do one first and the other one later. Okay, let's do Die Hard on a boat. Speed 2 Cruise Control with Sandra Bullock and not Keanu Reeves will be episode 2 of this season's theme, Die Hard Ons. This is going to be a lot of fun. A movie that nobody really wanted. Well, some people wanted, but not people who actually paid money to go see a movie in a theater wanted this movie and the return of sandy bullock to the show that's nice and i think we get our first introduction to willem dafoe oh wow is that right he's our bad guy and he sticks leeches on his body and he's crazy and shit i'm gonna have to look through the archives it 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 can't be this is the first willem i'm pretty sure this is willem dafoe's inaugural appearance on pick six movies it's shocking but it's true that's a reason to tune in right there (laughs) so come back and join us in two weeks as we bring you speed to cruise control as we continue a sextet of motion pictures all inspired by the wonderfully entertaining film Die Hard. Bo, do you have any final thoughts on Under Siege 2 Dark Territory that you would like to leave our loyal listeners with? I just wonder why he never taught me that cake trick with the microwave. <laughs> Pull down your pants, I'll show you a cake trick. <laughs> I'm a pervert. Ooh, looks like I'm going hand to hand after all. We'll see you in two weeks, everybody. Everybody.